Good morning, Community Church. Good morning as we come together this morning to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one and only way unto the Father. And this morning as we join together, it's wonderful to see the church enter the building. We are the body together, and we are here to serve him. If you're here for the first time, we want to welcome you. We're so glad to have you this morning. If you'd like to let us know that you visited with us and give us a little bit more information, we have these little uh, pew forms. We'd love to get uh, more information about you visiting with us. Or if you'd like to just sign our visitor, uh, our visitor register outside, we would love to have you do that as well. Um, we're just so happy to have you here this morning with us. We have a few of announcements, and I, and I want to get to this because we have several things to do this, this Sunday. And one of those things that we're going to do is pray for the ladies that are going off to do VBS at, five, at, no, at Military Avenue, sorry, at Military Avenue in Detroit. And so we're, li we're lifting them up as they'll be gone this week, uh, serving the young kids there and helping with the VBS. They have a two-week VBS, and we're helping out with the second half of that two-week VBS. So praying that that will be a blessing to the community down there. We're also co uh, continuing to collect up backpacks uh, for 5.7 uh, Church that's also in Detroit. You can see all of that information in the back couple pages of our bulletin. And then uh, our dear sister would like to give us an update on one of the events that was being planned So that was a, a cancellation of the trip to Cranbrook for the ladies that were going there. And Vicky, it sounds like Vicky's giving out cash afterwards. So, I think I was going. Uh, yeah, Dave was going to go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, you can please see Vicky after after the service. That would be wonderful. Um, we're. We're in a time now of preparing our hearts and minds for the worship of the Lord. And for some of us, that's hard because we had so many distractions over this week, and it's hard to come back and just to say, okay, Lord, I'm focused upon you. The joy of this service today is that uh, what we're singing together and what we're joining in in study is all of the words of praise that God has given us to give back to him. So let's think about that this morning. All of these songs are for the Lord, designed by the Lord unto him. And let us sing those together. Would you bow your heads with me? <clears throat> Father, we prepare our hearts right now by asking your spirit to speak to us, to encourage us, to strengthen us, to give us a peace and a calm to be focused upon you and you alone. So many other distractions in our week, going on in the world, going on in the news, and Lord, Right now, we need to come before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we need everything to be put back in the order in which it is all designed to be. Under your headship, Lord God, we desire to be aligned back again with you. So help us in this time, Lord, whether it's a matter of our confession as we pray just acknowledging our brokenness and our sinfulness and our need for your restoration in our life, Lord, that you bring through the cross. Or whether it's a recognition of perhaps we don't even know you and believe in you as deeply as we should. And you're drawing us to that deep place of faith and assurance that comes through belief in Jesus Christ. Lord, however you're meeting us today, perhaps you're even equipping us to go out and proclaim the good news of the truth of Jesus Christ and be able to point to other scriptures that point to Christ Jesus. Then, Lord, equip us this very day, we pray. We ask for your glory and your glory alone, your praises alone, to be what is the hallmark of this time. We set this aside this time aside for you, O oh Lord, to be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, saints. Good morning. I can't tell you how thrilled I am to 
have seven psalms in a row throughout this service and also the sermon regarding all this. This first song we know, it's from Psalm 134, which is the last psalm and the songs of ascent. As the Hebrews went up to Jerusalem, they would sing these 15 psalms back and forth. The interesting thing is that we're only singing a portion of it, and the other psalms were just singing a portion of the psalm except Psalm 100, which will come a few minutes later. Know that your work is to sing the refrain. Sing the antiphon, which means you're banking it off the three singers here. They'll do the uh, verses, but you do the um, cry out with joy to the Lord, all the earth. I have a lecture that would take up the entire service and the next 16 months about psalms. But you've got psalters. Don't miss by, by not reading through them and praying them. So let's stand together as we sing the last psalm in the Songs of Ascents. And this is a nighttime song, waking up the next group that's coming into the temple to worship. For our call to worship this morning, I'm going to be reading from Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruits in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, this morning I want to pray for myself and for the congregation that we would truly delight in the law of the Lord. I'm struck by that phrase and I not entirely sure what that means to its greatest extent, but it seems very clear that we can't delight in what we don't know. And I think all of us would benefit from knowing your word more. And as we know your word more, we will delight more in it. And so I, I pray for that. I pray for our time of worship this morning that we would set aside the distractions around us and be solely focused on bringing you honor and glory this morning. Your name I pray. Amen. We'll stay seated for this particular psalm. You might be interested to know that the text of the psalm itself, five or six verses, um, doesn't have a meter, it doesn't have a beat. So it has to be 
conducted. So, and uh, you'll catch on to this as we go, but your part is always arise, come to your God, sing him your songs of rejoicing. But really concentrate on the text and how it has a free flowing <clears throat> type of uh, rhythm to it. My wife will play the uh, introduction. The singers up here will sing it once through of Arise, and then you uh, mimic that after we, we do it. song is from 117, Psalm 117, the shortest psalm. It only has two little verses. So stick with us through three verses of this, singing a tune you know already. Stand together as we sing. Stop 
Psalm 25, a great one to sing and to study. And next time around, I think we'll be doing Psalm 24. You need to look these up to, to garner all the stuff that we can do with this. This is a rock and roll one. <laughs> to you, O God, I lift up my soul. And the Hebrews would have sung it this way. gates eternal. This moves. Be ready. <laughs> This week for Military Avenue, if you would come up here, ladies, we want to pray for you and we want to lift you up as a congregation. So come on up here, ladies. I know you guys weren't planning this. <laughs> 
Wonderful. Oh, what a joy. Yeah, just come line up right here, ladies. Elders, I didn't ask you guys, but you guys want to come up here? We're going to pray for these ladies as they go out on this mission trip this week. Oh. Go ahead and scoot over here, sweet. She might be serving somewhere. Okay. Well, let's pray together. We already have a sister who's serving. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for these wonderful sisters in Christ that are going forth from this place to be a blessing to Military Avenue, Lord, to all the children there, to uh, Barb and to Randy Brown as they serve there as well. Lord God, may, may you just watch over them in safety. May you watch over them as they travel, Lord, as they, um, as they gather together and serve there, as they stay down there, Lord. May you watch over them and keep them. But may you most of all make their ministry fruitful. May there be the gospel that is presented to so many hearts of these young children, Lord, that you would bring in a harvest even this week of understanding and truth. And we pray your blessing upon them in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. Thank you, ladies. Thank you for going and serving Christ. Okay, now it's time for the kids to come on up for our song and our lesson today. Come on up. Yeah. We, uh, we've been learning a song about God this summer. And as you know, it has motions. But what um, I realized as I was thinking about it is I have been kind of um, confusing on the motions to the second verse. So I, I kind of got, I think I know what we're going to do. All right. So we know the first verse. That's been pretty obvious. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Right? Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Now on the second verse, this is the final definitive uh, motion direction. All right? What a... Oh, let's see. We, <laughs> we will praise our mighty God. Okay, let's try that. We will praise our mighty God. We will praise our mighty God. Now, this is what I was not real clear on watching the video, anyway. Uh, we will praise the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, why would I do that? What do you think? Ryan, you were doing it. What do you, why would I do three? Because, why? God is three. Yeah, God is three and one. All right. So that's how we'll do that. All right. Now that's enough directions. Let's stand up and sing. If you want to join us, we're going to sing What a Mighty God We Serve. us to worship him. And so we've been talking about these all summer. Adoration. In adoring God, we remember who he is. Who is God? Well, God is the mighty God that we serve. And we just sang about that. But we sing all kinds of songs in our service about God and who he is and how we praise his name because of who he is. But we also confess our sins to him. That's an important part of our worship. We remember in confession who we are. 
Okay, so we're remembering who God is, but we're also remembering who we are. We're sinners who need to be forgiven for our sins. Last week we talked about thanksgiving, remembering what God has done. And I distinguish between adoration, where we remember who God is himself, and we remember to thank him for all the things he has done. And so these are important parts of our worship. But let's talk at this last one. This is the last week on this. But let's talk about that word supplication. That's a word that you guys never abused before. I almost guarantee it. And I guarantee that most of us have never used that word before. It's an old-fashioned word. But I want you to just say it with me so you start hearing it in your ears, okay? The word is supplication. Girls, can you can you say that? Supplication. Say it louder. I, supplication. Now that's a, a strange word. And if God wants us to worship him with supplication, what does it even mean? Well, the word supplication, like I said, a very old-fashioned word that really literally means to beg, to, to plead, all right? When you really want something, when you really want another bowl of ice cream, you can say to your mom, I supplicate, mom. I want another bowl of ice cream. But I, don't, I should be serious because when we're worshiping God, it's much more than just begging God for a bowl of ice cream. What we're really doing in our supplication is we're looking for him to solve the biggest problems in our lives. I was thinking about that. You know, we've been doing this, what a mighty God we serve, right? We did that uh, several times. Some of us who watched the news in the last week, we saw this on the news a lot. And I was thinking about that, thinking a lot about that because the way it's been described is fighting, all right? Fight. You know what? God fights for his people. God is the one who's, who we really need to fight for us. We serve a mighty God who fights for his people. And so when we supplicate, when we bring our supplications before God, we're saying, Lord, I can't fight for myself anymore. I need you to fight for me. And so we look forward to what God is going to do. That is something that will turn our prayers into a whole new realm of understanding. It's when we believe that our supplication means God is going to do something. He is going to fight for us because he is a mighty God. Our prayer in this church, I know Mr. and Mrs. Davis think about this often as they're preparing the worship services, is that this service would bring worship to God. And it would bring a smile to God's face because he is pleased with the worship that we are offering him. Now let's stand together, we're going to pray, and I'm going to ask God to confirm this truth to all of us today. Lord, thank you for fighting for your people, the people that you love. I was thinking about the words of one of the songs we sing, especially in October during Reformation Sunday, Mighty Fortress. Though this world with devils filled, should threaten to undo us. We will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. Lord, you, it says, will win the battle. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so much that you fight for your people. And so we can bring our our pleas, we can bring our burdens, our requests, our weakness, all of these things to you and believe that you will win the battle. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Let's continue to pray together. Father, thank you so much for giving us songs of praise unto you. Thank you for reminding us of the truth of who you are throughout your word, O oh God. What a precious gift it is that we have your word spoken to us. And Lord Jesus, let us not take this for ed, ed, disadvantage, Lord. Let us advance the kingdom and seek you in it. May we all indulge in your word every day. May we sun, sit at your feet and study you and listen to you and understand who you are, O oh God. May you speak to us. Speak to us in those quiet moments of truth, revealing, convicting us of, of how we are broken from you and your righteousness and your holiness and your truth. And that's where the joy of understanding your law, O oh God, that gives us the truth of who we are in light of a righteous and holy God. And, and so, Lord, help us to study that and to understand and as we understand, we understand the gap between us. We are your creation, yet you are so transcendent beyond us. Your thoughts are not like our thoughts. Your ways are not like our ways. So, Lord, we have to realize how, how other you are in so many ways. And by doing so, we realize, oh God, that we are far from ever accomplishing being righteous as you are. So we confess to you our brokenness. We confess to you our sin. We confess to you our rebellion against the King of Kings and his laws. Lord, many of us are even right now hiding secret sins in our lives, ones that only you know, O oh Lord. And we pray that you would reveal those things to us right now that you would even bring them into light, that they would be seen, and Lord God, by the exposing of being seen, even by others, O oh Lord, that that would bring us to a place of repentance and confession, and realizing, O oh God, we need you. Every hour we need you. And Lord, sometimes there are sins that we allow just in our lives, like little white lies, a little bit of gossip, turning the other cheek when it comes to helping somebody instead of going out of our way to care for them. Not loving our brothers and sisters. Not loving our neighbors. And what pierces our heart, Lord, is not loving our enemies because that convicts almost all of us. Lord God, before you in your holiness and your righteousness and your transcendence, we stand condemned. If it were not for your son, Jesus Christ. His blood covers us. His sacrifice makes us new. You have not only, Lord God, uh, established a place of forgiveness, but you have brought us into your Son, Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, it reminds us that we are in Christ, seated in the heavenlies with him already. Lord, that means that we're in a position that we have to eventually get to, but right now in your mind and I, we are already present in heaven with you. Lord, help us to understand that as we serve you, as we love you, as we, as we walk in this world, Lord God. Help us to understand this, that we can turn from sin because of the power of your Holy Spirit living within us. That we can recognize what sin is according to your word. And that we can live according to what you have called us to do. Give us strength to do this, Lord. Give us, give us help. And when we fall, Lord, lift us up. Remind us again that we are in Christ, that that never goes away. Once we are yours, we are yours forever. So that strikes to the heart, who today, O oh Lord, are you calling unto yourself for salvation? Who today has not cried out to you, 
I believe in you. I trust in you. Your sacrifice is one that I should have had. I should have died on that cross. But you died for me. You gave yourself for me that I would be forgiven. You took the punishment that I deserve. Lord, if you are calling anyone within this congregation unto yourself, may you call them today in faith. May they believe today in your truth. They might not know the fullness of all, what all that means, but Lord, may today, may they put their trust and their weight of their whole life and their whole eternal life upon you. And may you save them, O God, as you have appointed before the foundations of the world and written their name in the book of life that you are calling them to this day to be saved. And Lord, we rejoice in your salvation. And we thank you that we can be together as a church serving you here in this community, Lord, serving you even outside the boundaries by the partners that we have in ministry. We think of uh, the youngs today. Jonathan and Fosia, we lift them up to you. And I praise you, Lord, that I got a chance to, to meet with them and talk with them at, at General Assembly. And, and they're just so overjoyed by the partnership that we have with them. Oh, Lord, may you, li may you lift them up and strengthen them for their ministry as they minister in India. Help them, oh, Lord, because that is a continent with millions of gods. And yet... You and you alone will prevail over all of these that proclaim themselves to be gods. For you alone are God. There is no one beside you. There is no one above you. You alone are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we praise you this very day, Lord, and we ask you to be with us as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 51, of course, is the song of David after his sin with Bathsheba. This is appropriately a place in this particular part of our service as we've heard about uh, confession. Let's sing together. Just for 
upon me, O God of hosts, I cry, and see and take You see it, please. <clears throat> Good morning, church. As you know, we're doing a study through the Old Testament, through the New Testament, and we're seeking every moment in which we can see Christ within the Scriptures. Today we're in Psalms. Okay, if you thought I had a hard job before, it's just gotten harder, but in the reverse way. I've got too many choices, too many places where there's prophecy and there's revealing of a type of who Christ will be. And so this morning as we come to this, I, I come to this with the, the same exuberance and, and excitement that my dear sister and brother have in being able to sing all these songs, is to be able to study the, the rich theology and truth that exists in these songs. And so this morning as we look to Psalms, we're going to look for who is Christ within these psalms? And a psalm is a song, just like we've sung all of these. They're ancient songs of the Hebrew people. Ancient songs about Yahweh, their God, and, and moments in which there's prophecy of one who will come from God, who will be the great salvation. And so what I want to propose this morning is that the title of my sermon captures who I think Christ is revealed in these psalms. Christ is our song of salvation. The very song that we sing of, our, of the saving grace of God in our lives is Christ himself. And we can find him in the psalms. Let me give you an understanding of the structure of psalms so you understand first and foremost. So I, I wanted to describe this to you in this way. There are five books in Psalms. The Psalms are broken up into five books, okay? So you can see every chapter of these books. And it kind of gives you an idea of what is progressing or what is the theme of these Psalms that have been put together in this style. And so you see the first book is Psalm 1 through 41, and it is the rise of the king. The rise of the king and all of King David and all of uh, his, his learning and growing of being a king, his woes, his need for God to be present, his need for God to be his victor and his strength, and it grows in this way. Book two is the rise of the kingdom itself, not just the king, but the whole kingdom that God is building for his people. And then in Psalm 73 to 89, we have the exile, and we have the suffering of the people, and we have the, the lament to the people and the desire for God to return and restore and renew. And then we have in, in uh, Psalm 90 to 106, we have a future hope. There begins to be a cry of hope and joy of who the Lord is and all that he will bring and all that he will restore. And there is a future for God's people coming into even greater. There's not only a future for God's people, but there is a new David. There is a new king that is coming who will be greater than all the kings we've ever seen. Now, when you read the book of Psalms, you probably just thought this is just a collection of songs that they just kind of put all together, and you'd read them, and they go, okay, well, that was nice. Let's flip over a few other pages. Does this help give you some structure? So as you read this, you see a whole development, and what does it all look like it's pushing towards? Who Christ will be. And that's why I say uh, Christ is our song of salvation. So this morning as we read this, we, we understand that psalms themselves cover a, a large category of the human experience as well as a, as a greater understanding of who God is in light of our human experience. Psalms are songs of praise and lament, joy and sorrow, faith in God. These songs were inspired by the Holy Spirit, that means God himself, to each author over 500 years the Psalms cover. 
over 500 years of different psalmists and psalms at times. Each author is given their own personality to the song and even what they are going through individually in their lives and in the people of Israel in that moment. They speak truth because they're inspired by God himself. So as we sing the Psalms, as we read the Psalms, we read truth and good theology about who God is. Not only does this psalm capture the present state of the psalmist and the present state of the world around him, but it also, as we see, reveals Christ and the promised Messiah to come. Christ is the song of our salvation. So this morning we're going to sing of two things regarding him. We're going to sing of his suffering and we're going to sing of his splendor. And there's nuances within that of what we see within the Psalms. We're going to sing of his suffering and we're going to sing of his splendor. So if you'd open up your Bibles with me to Psalm 22 is where we'll begin this morning. Psalm 22. Familiar to many of us, especially in light of the gospel story in Christ upon the cross, we have this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far away from me? From my words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by my people. All who see me mock me, and their mouth, they, mouth, they make mouths at me and wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him from his, for he delights in him. As we consider these verses this morning, consider this. Consider the way in which Christ suffered. It's described here nearly by King David, nearly a thousand years before Christ would actually suffer. And the suffering that he endures, first and foremost, is as we see in Matthew 25, 40, or 27, 46, when Jesus is upon the cross and cries out. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Many would think and have preached like he, he was, he was uh, so, so overwhelmed by God turning his face away and by God not looking at him. And all of a sudden he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this was a cry of, uh, of God has abandoned Jesus. But what really is going on here? Jesus is quoting a psalm. Jesus is proclaiming the first part of a psalm. And in those ancient days, when you proclaimed a part of a psalm, particularly the first verse, it was as if you were reciting the whole psalm. Wouldn't that be convenient? We could just say first, first verses to each other and it would be, oh, okay, I gotcha. Because we would have all the psalms memorized. That all I have to do is start you out and you keep going. I could do that with many of us right now. I pledge allegiance. Okay, yeah, you've got it. The moment they heard the verse, all the rest follows. So though this psalm is about suffering, it's also about hope. Here is Christ giving his life upon the cross. And he calls out in this suffering that he's experiencing the brokenness of the one and only man who's had perfect relationship with God ever since Adam, without falling away. And suddenly he feels the depth 
spiritually in his life of a separation between him and God because of all of the sin that God has now put upon him. This is a spiritual suffering. As he cries out in this moment, I, I need to move along, don't I? You guys are waiting for these. There we go. It's a spiritual suffering. There's a spiritual suffering that's happening in Christ Jesus, and one in which we cannot fathom the depths of this suffering. Of all the other suffering that Jesus goes through, we can identify. But in the spiritual suffering of Christ, and what he's enduring at this moment, this moment as a human being who's had perfect unity with the Father, and in this moment in his humanity is feeling the weight of sin upon him, I don't want you to start to wonder, was now Jesus somehow separated from, did this just break apart the, the, the union of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? No, it did not. The Son was still the Son. It wasn't a matter of, of the Father turning His face away from the Son. I want to I put it this way, because this is the wrath of God putting sin upon His Son, what he's lamenting about is the weight of all of that sin upon him like he's never felt before. To actually now experience what it means to have a brokenness as a human being from God. We all live in this. Christ did not. And now he has generation after generation after generation of all of those sins placed upon him. I don't know about you, but one person's sin in a lifetime would be enough to crush me. If it wasn't by the grace of God, I would be crushed. And yet Jesus experienced that, that, spiritual, sac that spiritual suffering at that moment. He still had perfect unity as the Son, and yet the Father looked at him at this moment. That's my that's my estimation because I don't find anywhere else in Scripture. You guys can come correct me if I'm wrong if the Father ever turned His face away. I think it's a lovely song, but I don't see it in Scripture. I think instead God's eyes were upon where His wrath was pouring out. And it didn't move. And it didn't leave. And in fact, what Jesus felt was the burden that all of us should feel about our sin. Crushing Him. That's where he felt forsaken. And yet, as he says forsaken, there is hope within the psalm. But he's not done there yet. It was a spiritual suffering, but there was more to it. There was also a social suffering. There was a psychological suffering. It goes on in verse, in verse 6. He says, I am, but, I am a worm. I'm not a man. That, that spiritual side is he's realizing I, I, I'm less than even a man at this moment. I'm, I'm so downtrodden in my heart and my soul. I feel like I'm not even a human being. He's scorned by mankind. He's despised by his people. He's mocked. They wag their, they wag their heads at him. Even, even mocking his own relationship with God. He trusts in the Lord. Let him, deli let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. This is all echoed within the New Testament. As we read about Jesus upon the cross, as we read about those who are around him in that very moment. And we see this in the crucifixion of Jesus in John chapter 19. So they took Jesus and went out and bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two robbers on one, one side of him and one on the other, and Jesus between them. Many of the Jews read the inscription, and the inscription above him said, Jesus, the king of the Jews. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic and Latin and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather that this man said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, What I have written, I have written. 
And when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But his tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots to see who, shall, who it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which read, they divided my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things by standing by the cross of Jesus, where his, he goes on here to say, you know, to, uh, to John and to Mary, uh, please take my mom, please take care of her. In this, though, Jesus cries out, Verse eight, verse twenty-eight. After this, Jesus, knowing that all that all was now finished, and so to fulfill all Scripture, said, "I thirst." And a jar of sour wine was brought before him. So they put a sponge on it of the sour wine on on the hyssop branch, and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, "It is finished." And he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. And that very day, that was a day in which many were passing by and proclaiming, we see this in Matthew and Luke and Mark, and they were wagging their tongues at him and they were saying, if he is the Messiah, then, then, then let him come down. Let, let's see, he had this relationship with God. Let's see if God will rescue him now. Wait and see. In the same mocking tone that we see with David, he trusts in the Lord. Let's see if God saves him. Verse 14, we see this also. We see that it is more than just psychological. It's more than just people turning and seeing him suffer, having no compassion on him, but watching him intently and with derision and with hate. They would gloat over him. They would mock him and scorn him and wag their heads at him. They would taunt him in his relationship with the Lord. So he, he dealt with this socially and psychologically, which all of us can identify with that. If we stand out and we stand with Christ, we are standing out as a target. You can talk about God all you want on TV, but the moment you name, you name who you're talking about and you say, I'm talking about Jesus, everybody goes, ah. Oh. You know, it, it just changes the tenor of everything. You can talk about that with your friends. You can talk about God. You can talk about spiritual things. But the moment you say Jesus, uh, we understand the social and the psychological, but probably not to the extent that he endured it that day. Can you imagine the shame of carrying a cross, having been whipped and beaten through the town with everybody jeering. Everybody who was cheering you the week before, Hosanna, Hosanna, is now cursing you. Well, he also dealt with the physical. And this is often what we focus on when we talk about Easter, we talk about the resurrection, we talk about all that time of, of Christ's suffering. We often point to the suffering of his physicality. Look at verses 14 and following. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint, and my heart is like wax and melts within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me down in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, and a band of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. This is a thousand years before Jesus is upon the cross. And David is talking about his own suffering and what he's going through. But as he does, he is also seeing in many ways a prophetic moment of who God will be. John Calvin wrote this about Psalm 22. David complains in this psalm that he is reduced to such circumstances of distress that he is like a man in despair. But after having recounted the calamities which, which, with which 
he was so severely afflicted, he emerges from the abyss of temptations and gathers courage, comfort, and comforts himself with assurance of deliverance. Then listen to this. At the same time, he sets before us in his own person a type of Christ who he knew by the spirit of prophecy behooved to be abased in marvelous and unusual ways previous to his exalt previous to his exaltation to the father calvin basically says what what David is experiencing here and trying to communicate is one that even by the Spirit proclaims who Christ is going to be. Look at this. The, his joints are all pulled out. One of the things that are talked about in crucifixion is how the joints are pulled and pulled and pulled as the arms are stretched to even try to pull yourself up to get a breath of air. And we hear about the melting of the heart within. It, it, I, I love the poetic language. You can, you can get the sense of, of strength just draining away from him. Life just ebbing away. That his strength is dried up like a pot shirt, just dry and brittle. And that even his own jaw sticks to the roof of his mouth. And, and, and that description of Jesus saying, I thirst and he cries out to say, I thirst. And what, is, what does John say that fulfills? Scripture. He cries out to say, I thirst. He's, he's saying, I've echoed every single moment of this suffering. Even his hands and feet are what? Pierced. You know what was not existent in David's time as far as execution in, in Israel? Crucifixion. And yet, what did David imagine? Of all the things that could be pierced, he could have said, my head is pierced, my side is pierced, my foot, you know, or my knee, you know, somebody, arrow to the knee, all these different things. But instead, he says, my hands and my feet. And prophetically, we know that that is exactly what Christ endured. There's a chiastic structure, by the way, to all of Psalm 22, and when I talk about a chiastic structure, that means that we got to come to the very, very center and we get the heart of what's going on within this psalm. And you know what verse that's found in? Verse 15, right at the bottom. You lay me in the dust of death. The heart of this psalm, though there is hope, there is a moment of suffering. And what David brings out by, by bringing this chiastic structure, he says, right now I feel like I'm dead. You, O oh God, are laying me down in this place of dust and death. So as we sing in the psalms, though there's 14 to 17, just depends on who you're talking to as a commentator. 14 to 17 direct whole psalms that deal with the Messiah, deal with Christ to come. And there's probably about 25 psalms altogether that have verses that are prophetic, that point to things that Jesus would fulfill in his ministry. But right here in Psalm 22, we understand the suffering and we actually sing of the suffering of Christ. Why would we sing of such a song of suffering? Well, what else is within this psalm? Is a psalm of hope, a psalm of joy. All the ends of the earth, Psalm 20, uh, 22, 27, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you, for kings belong to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. There's such a, a joy within this psalm of suffering. There's a hope within God himself. So even Christ, as he's upon the cross, as he begins to proclaim this psalm. This psalm is one of being crushed spiritually, crushed socially, psychologically, but it's also, and physically, but it's also one of great hope. Though he is the one being put to death, there is hope. So turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 110. 110. We're taking a look at the first book 
I told you about the, the rise of the king. And now we're looking at the fifth book, The Hope of a New David. Psalm 110. And we're going to sing of his splendor. Sing of his splendor. We've sang of his suffering, but now we're going to sing of his glories. We're going to sing of the glories of Christ and the praises of his uh, majesticness. And, uh, and with all of this elicits praise and hope and joy in who Christ will be. And this is also one that Jesus himself refers to. He refers in Matthew 22, 44 to 45. He speaks to the Pharisees regarding uh, the psalm itself. And the Lord said, uh, Jesus is speaking to the to the Pharisees right now. He says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word. Nor from that day would anyone dare to ask him any more questions. And so what do we read in Psalm 110? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in his holy garments from the womb of the morning and the dew of your youth will be yours. And the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will scatter the kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, fill them with corpses. He will scatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way and therefore he will lift up his head. So what is this psalm speaking of? If I say that this song is speaking of the splendor of, of Christ himself, then I want us to look at a few things. The first part is the splendor of his station. Look at his station. Jesus even brings this forth as the Pharisees come to talk to Jesus in Matthew 22. And he stumps them with this question. He says, let me ask you a question about a psalm, shall I? Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord. Now, if this is King David, the king, who is the Lord over King David? And who is the other Lord? Well, in the psalm itself, we see this very clearly that the Lord, the first part, the Lord said to my Lord, Yahweh said to my Adonai in the Hebrew. Yahweh, that is the name of God alone, said to my Lord, Adonai. Here's King David, the king of all of Israel. Who's the Adonai over him? There's someone over him, and then there would be Yahweh. And so David sees this, and, he, and, he, and many times the, at, in that moment, the Pharisees would have said, oh, well, that was Solomon, his son. Well, wait a second. This is, why David, uh, this is why Jesus says, how can his son be his own Lord? Someone else is to be counted as this. And Jesus claims this countenance by even talking about this and proclaiming this to them. This is a station that he has. Jesus is Lord, Adonai. He is one who, is, uh, who has power and authority. And if we look at this as a parallel, in fact, the, the verses are parallel, uh, the Lord, and what does the Lord do? We see this in verse 5. What does the Lord do? Look at verse 5. I read this to you. The Lord is at your right hand. He will scatter the kings in the day of his wrath. So he is given splendor and authority in which to even bring forth his strength and his power. Romans chapter 14 says this, For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. 
So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For this is the end Christ died and lived again. For this end Christ died and lived again. That he may be Lord, both of the dead and of the living. Even the Apostle Paul saw Jesus in this, uh, this splendor and this authority that he has as Adonai, as Lord. He has, he has rulership over us. And when the time in which he comes, he is going to do what with the kings? He's going to bring forth his wrath. Now, when Jesus came, he brought forth instead his service to us as a high priest. But when he's coming again, he will bring his wrath. What else is Jesus in this way? He's also a ruler. And we see this as we go on in, in verse 2. And the Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. So the purpose of what God says to, to what the purpose of what Yahweh says to the Adonai who is above David is sit here until I make your enemies what? Your footstool. So he says, basically, sit beside me in the seat of power and authority. And what God is going to do is make all of the enemies of Christ be under his feet. That he's going to do in his lordship. And then as they are under his feet, he says, now rule. And the word for rule in Hebrew has a sternness to it. Has a strength to it of holding down enemies. And the scepter, this, yeah, it looks like a micro, it looks a bit like a microphone, right? But this, this example of an ancient bejeweled scepter is one that the king would hold. And we see this in the story of Esther. And Esther had to come in, if she came into the presence of the king and was not uh, supposed to be there, she had to go up and touch the scepter and hope that he would let her live. This was a symbol of power. And so Jesus himself is going to not only be Lord, and not only is he the one in whom all the enemies of Christ will be underneath him by the work of God, but he will also rule over them in strength and in power. And what we're talking about here is judgment. What we're talking about is that Jesus himself, whoever this Adonai is that David sees, is one that has power and authority to even be able to rule over the enemies. David must have been so hopeful of whatever this would be and whoever this would be. He was joyful in this moment of who he would be. There would be strength and power and authority. But look at this. This is the part that's amazing to me. The parallel to this, by the way, is in verse 6. The parallel is he will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will scatter the chiefs over the wide earth. That's not what we imagine about Jesus, is it? Unless we read the book of Revelation and we see the coming king in judgment. And then we understand, oh wait, this is a whole different view of Messiah that David is seeing. But look at what he says in verse 4. The Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. While we remember Melchizedek, we talked about him a few weeks ago. He comes out of Genesis and he's just a man who appears on the scene. We don't know where he's from or who his people are. He just appears out of the city of Salem, which is believed to be later Jerusalem. It means the city of peace. And he comes out and he's a king and he's also a priest of the Most High God. And Abraham comes to him and gives him a tenth, gives him a tithe. And Melchizedek actually even gives him a blessing from the Most High God. And then he kind of disappears from the story, and we don't see him again. And it's amazing to me that David now proclaims, this one who is coming, who will be king, his station, his Adonai, his lordship, his rulership, will also be one of a priesthood. And a priesthood like this mysterious man of the past, Melchizedek. A man who has no beginning and has no end. 
This will be the priesthood of this king. And he will be a priest how long? For just a couple days, right? Oh, forever. He will be an eternal priest. And he will be a priest of what? Look at verse 7. He will drink from the brook on the way. And therefore, he will lift up his head. You know what that sign for lift up his head means? In the ancient days, if you came before a king, what were you to do? Bow. Bow. When were you supposed to look up? Most of us, we've watched the medieval movies and stuff. Oh, they just bow and then they up, right? No, no, no. In that day, you did not raise your eyes up to the king unless he came by and said, okay, you can look at me. So everybody in the room would have their eyes down and only the privileged few would have their heads lifted up. Remember Daniel? Daniel has this vision. He's talking to the, to the butler and he's talking to the baker and he tells, him, he tells one of them, he says, hey, in three days from now, uh, the king will lift up your head and then to the other, and the king will lift up your head from your body. <laughs> Two different meanings, right? One means you'll be at peace with the king. Look at, he drinks by the brook. He restores himself. He refreshes himself. And he lifts up his head. He is a priest of peace. What a, what a contrast of power and authority. And he's going to crush all these enemies and put them under his feet. But in reality, in the works that he does, he is a, he is a priest of peace. Peace to whom? Peace to his people. His people will live in peace. Why? Because he is ruler. Because he is Lord. Sing of his splendor, O brothers and sisters. And and what we look forward to in Christ Jesus. But also, let's sing of this. Sing of his splendor in his significance. Psalm 118, turn with me a few more pages. Psalm 118, I won't take you into 119. I've already been there before. The longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119. Uh, I love that psalm, but I'm not going there today. I'll save you all that today. Psalm 118, turn to uh, verse 20 and 21. I'll start in 19 here. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them. And give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And the Lord is doing this. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. Oh, Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is you, bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festive sacrifice cords up to the horn of the altar. You are my God, and I will give, you, give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And everyone said together, for his steadfast love endures forever. This psalm is about the hesed, the steadfast love of God. In the Hebrew, the word is hesed, and it means this covenant love that God has, this long-suffering love Well, why does his love have to be described as long-suffering? Because he's got to deal with us, right? He's got to deal with his people, and he's got to endure us in our failings, in 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 our rebellion, in our sin, and still he loves us. And so what we see here in this, in the significance of God, in the significance of his splendor right here, is we see that Christ himself is a rejoicing. Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. Now, what does this mean to be a chief cornerstone? Well, I was, I was instructed by a, a good contractor friend of mine uh, who sent me a text. 
And that text included this, to remind me of how important this chief cornerstone is. Uh, he says, I, I wanted to share with you what a big deal the, the chief cornerstone is. It sets the plumb line. It sets the level, the square, and the elevation. If any of those are off in the structure, it'll be wrong in height, it'll be wrong leaning, it'll be wrong running, it might even run down a hill. That's why Christ is our cornerstone. Really, it has to do more with the foundation in Christ and the significance of it and every part of him being truly in our lives. I think about that and I think, wow, what he's saying here is that there is a cornerstone that the builders, and who are the builders in that moment when he's talking about this? He's talking about the spiritual leaders in, in the day. And what house, what place is he talking about? He says, enter through the gates with joy and thanksgiving. What gates are the righteous gates? The gates of the temple. And so where is this cornerstone? This cornerstone is the cornerstone of the temple itself. It's going to give it its height and its depth and its plumb and everything to it. And who is the chief cornerstone? Is Jesus himself. He is our chief cornerstone. We see this in Matthew 21, 42. And Jesus said to them, Have you ever read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected have become the cornerstone. And this is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken into pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Wow, Jesus was really strong about who he was. But you hear, do you hear some words of lordship? Do you hear some words of strength in this? That this is not just setting the line for our lives. This is something deeper. This is all of, re, all of worship, all of service, all of relationship with God is based on Christ being the cornerstone. And we got that a thousand years before, revealed in Scripture, showing us who Jesus would be, that he would be in so many ways so significant that we cannot worship, we cannot praise, we cannot have any relationship. Let me say that again. We cannot have any relationship with God except through Jesus Christ. That is how incredibly important he is and significant. Well, not only that, but he is also the one who brings us salvation. Look at this in verse 25. They say, save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What does this sound like? The triumphant entry of Jesus. In fact, if I were to say this word, save us, they say, Hoshia, Hoshia. What would we say? Hosanna, save us. This very proclamation, what the people were saying as they waved the palm leaves and they laid down their robes in front of the donkey that Jesus was riding into Jerusalem that day, giving him praises and singing unto him, was they were saying, Hoshia, save us. You know what Jesus' name in Hebrew is? Yeshua. Which is the same core word of Hoshia. They were practically proclaiming his name as he came through with the emphasis on save us. Don't just be God's salvation. Save us, we pray. And brothers and sisters, do we, do we pray this to the Lord? Hosanna. Save me, O oh Lord. Be with me. Show me not only that you are mighty to save and you are the one who is bringing salvation, but I want you, brothers and sisters, to now flip with me all the way back to the first book in chapter 16. Flip with me to chapter 16 and we'll close with this. 
That even as the people in Matthew 21 proclaimed as he entered the city with joy, proclaiming, Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David, to the blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. In chapter 16 of Psalms, we read this in verse 10. You will not abandon my soul to Sheol, Sheol being the pit, being the place where all the dead go. You will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. In Mark chapter 1, verse 24, it is an unclean spirit, a demon that turns to Jesus and says, what do you want of us? O Holy One of God. Jesus alone was the Holy One of God, the one separated and alone that belonged to God Himself, who was God. In Acts chapter 13, verse 33, Paul gives the gospel in Antioch and he quotes this very psalm as a proof about Jesus, but about one particular thing that he rose again from the dead. It says, you will not let your see, Holy One see corruption. This means decay. This means destruction. This means the decay of death. And it implies what? You will, instead of letting that Holy One see corruption, you will raise him again. And so in the splendor of what we sing about the Lord, we also sing about his resurrection. We sing about all of these things throughout the Psalms and so many more. And as you explore this and as you read this in your time of study and as we go down this redemption road, I hope when you get to Psalms, you just savor every single one and you see who Christ will be and you rejoice in who he is and understand that he is the very center point of our lives. We will sing of his suffering and we'll also sing of his splendor. We'll sing of all the different ways in which he, in, he endured our sins on our behalf and set us free. And not only that, but he is now our priest forever. He is a priest who will watch over us and he is also a Lord of strength and power and will bring justice. If you ever feel like justice will never happen, don't worry, we just read it. He will come with justice. But because of him, we can enjoy the peace that God brings. And because of him, we too have peace now and forever. Let us sing of his suffering and his splendor forever, for he is our song of salvation. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you. We can't do justice in just 30, 40 minutes on the Psalms, or even to bring out who Christ is throughout all these Psalms, but thank you, Lord, for what you have revealed. And we pray, Lord, that it would strengthen us and encourage us in our relationship with you. And to those who hear, maybe even for the first time today, that there is a relationship and someone who has interceded on our behalf and our brokenness and our sin and has taken that away by punishing his son, that we would be set free. And Lord, may today, may they understand and grow and trust in you even more. And may to those of us who trust you, O Lord, already, may we deepen and be strengthened by the proclamations of who you are. May we know and live out who you are in our lives, O God, by the power of your Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our uh, ending song here, of course, is from Psalm 145. <clears throat> we say G because it's one of many on this particular psalm. <clears throat> it's a banner song for us, I think. <clears throat> and I imagine this early this morning, <clears throat> we won't do this, but just in your mind you can. One generation will call to the next as we sing this, arms around each other, proclaiming, that we extol you, O God and King, 
and then we pass that on, and not only do we pass it on to the next generation, but they pass it back to us. So it's an open door either way. We need the new children of God and also the old. Stand together as we sing Psalm 145 in our Psalter. <laughs> about God is the most important thing about us. Consider that when you consider how you worship the Lord, because it will affect how high and how pure we imagine Him and see Him in His truth, or how base and how low we will actually worship Him. And He has given us such a treasury of those things to give us truth about Him, to know Him and to worship Him. So my encouragement to you is know the Lord in his truth. May he bless us by his hand. May he give us grace by his spirit. May his presence with us be one of soothing words of comfort in times of trial, in times of sorrow. 
May it be a word of strength and encouragement and challenge to us when we are walking away in times of sin, in times away from him. And may we hear the voice that calls us back to peace and joy because of the sacrifice of our King. To him be glory and honor and praise now and forever. And the church says, amen. amen. God bless you.